no matter our current circumstance, God remains faithful, forever present. He never leaves us, never forsakes us, and we have gathered to worship him this morning, for he is Lord of all. He is the God of peace and the God of hope and the God of restoration. He is the way maker, the miracle worker, the promise keeper, and he is light in the darkness. Oh God, rain down on us as we worship you.
Shower us with your mercy and grace. Pour out your loving kindness and drench us with your presence. Refresh us and restore us as we worship you this morning. Draw us together in your love. Strengthen your church this day to be the difference, for the world needs to see Jesus. We lift our prayer in the precious name, the powerful name, the name above all names, Jesus Christ, our Lord, our Savior. Amen. We worship through the reading of God's holy word. And our Old Testament reading this morning is from Proverbs chapter 15, verses 16 through 17. Better a little with the fear of the Lord than great wealth with turmoil. Better a small serving of vegetables with love than a fattened calf with hatred. And this is the word of God. Thanks be to God for his word. You know, while we live in a world full of chaos and confusion, it is so good to know that when the oceans rise, we can rise above the storm if we are still and know that He is God.
Our New Testament reading this morning comes from the book of Hebrews. I'll be reading from Hebrews chapter 11, verses 1 through 3. Now faith is confidence in what we hope for and assurance about what we do not see. This is what the ancients were commended for. By faith, we understand that the universe was formed at God's command so that what is seen was not made out of what was visible. And this is the word of God. Thanks be to God for his word. And this morning as we gather in worship, I know that so many of us in these times of uncertainty have certainly drawn near to God and asked God what is simply next. But perhaps as we were just reminded that the greatest thing that we can do in these times of uncertainty is just be still before God. Put our faith and trust in him alone and know that God will guide our steps as we follow him in this journey of life. And this morning as we do come in worship, we are called to give because when we give, it is a reflection of our trust and our faith in God. So First Baptist Church family, I thank you so much for your continued and faithful giving to God and his kingdom because we have not ceased reaching out in love and sharing the message of hope in Jesus Christ with the world around us. And we have made giving at First Baptist Church easy, convenient, and very secure. We have online giving, we have text giving, and you can also mail in your tithes and your offerings. You can visit our website, fbcmooresville.com slash giving to learn more. But again, thank you so much for your faithful giving. Let's go to God now in prayer. Gracious God, as your children and as followers of your son, Jesus Christ, I pray that this church family would not cease giving and honoring you with that which you have blessed us with. Let us not forget this community around us and the hurt and the suffering. And let us always remember that we can be a part of expanding your kingdom here in this place and helping others experience Jesus Christ and his mercy and his grace and his love that he so freely gave to each and every one who choose to follow him when he died on the cross. And so I pray that, God, we would be willing to to sacrifice our little so that you can make it much. We thank you for this opportunity. and Let us not take it for granted. And let us just continue to remember that all that we have here in this place is only temporary. But the love that you have for us is forever. We pray this prayer in the name of Christ, our Lord and our Savior. Amen.
Once again, it is a blessing to be in God's house with this praise team and musicians. And I pray that you have been as blessed by their music as am I. And I appreciate that very much. Today we embark upon looking at the scriptures in uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verses 16 through 18. And I invite you at home, as well as those in the building, our ten here, uh, as we seek to honor the prescriptions of our leaders in this pandemic. Uh, we invite you to read with us from God's Holy Word. Today I'll be reading from the New International Translation of God's Word. If you're not a member of First Baptist Church and yet you view these services, I will admit there are times that I quote from other translations. I love all the translations. I will um, refer to uh, Hebrews 11 and the King James simply because uh, it is a faithful translation, first of all, and also because it is uh, what I memorized and it's just so memorable and poetic. Uh, faith, as uh, Pastor B.J. had read earlier, faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. And today's sermon is entitled, The Power of Things Unseen. We're dealing with quite a lot these days. Great challenges, powerful issues, um, things that are so powerful but are not seen. We see the evidence of their uh, existence. We see the consequences of many times things that are invisible to the eye. None of us have seen the virus. Probably none of us. Um, even those of us who've contracted the virus, and thank God we've recovered, we didn't see the virus come through however we contracted it, through uh, droplets or through aerosol or whatever method that was. But we know the power, the negative power of this virus. We see attitudes around us, some that are so powerfully positive to us as we see folks who, um, who revel in the mercy and the power of the salvation and the blessing of God's presence of salvation in Jesus' name of the power of His Word. But we see also the negative power of attitudes that are divisive and destructive and demeaning and truly evil. And Paul, as he writes to encourage the church at Corinth, he is not immune to these influences. He's not immune to the things that are seen and the things that are unseen. But Paul, as he writes to the Hebrews, and as he writes to the Corinthians, to Jews and Gentile alike, he reminds us that uh, we look not to the things that are seen, those things that are temporary, temporal, as much value as we place on them, the things that are important to our lives, but not most important. Things that we acquire, things that we need. A place to live, transportation, things that we utilize in our lives. These are important, but they're not most important. And Paul, who knows what it is to be in want and then to be also in abundance, he says that in the midst of all this movement through life, we need to keep our minds focused on what truly is of eternal importance. And so as we look at the challenges that you and I face, I hope that you face them with the knowledge of our daily lives, dealing with issues, good and bad, are not all there is to life. There is so much more. The things we cannot see, God's presence in our life, His will for us, His unerring presence to walk with us, His unfailing Word, His undying forgiveness and love for us. We can't see it, but we feel its effects. And we want to focus on those things the power of the unseen blessings of God and promises of God rather than those things that we can see but nonetheless are temporary. And so now we read from Holy Scripture. I invite you to join with me. Paul writes, Therefore we do not lose heart, though outwardly we are wasting away, yet inwardly we are being renewed day by day. For our light and momentary troubles are achieving for us an eternal glory that far outweighs them all. So, 
We fix our eyes not on what is seen, but what is unseen. For what is seen is temporary, but what is unseen is eternal. Let's pray together. <clears throat> Father God, we thank you for the gift of this day. We thank you for the magnanimous gift of salvation that we celebrate through Christ Jesus, our only Lord and Savior. We thank you for your perfect word that instructs us, that exhorts us, that corrects us, that inspires us, that leads us to the light of the world in the person of Jesus the Christ. We thank you for the opportunity to worship in spirit and in truth. And Father, we long for and we trust you for the time that we'll be able to physically regather. But Father, we also thank you for the wisdom of those who instruct us, for the medical professionals and the scientists who have so selflessly served our nation and the world, for those who have researched and for their intellect, for your blessing upon them to develop vaccines. And Lord, we thank you for all of our congregation and community who have had access to that vaccine. We pray that soon they'll get the second dose. And Lord, we pray that you'd make us mindful that this virus, that the negative things in life, that the challenges that we face, they are temporary. Lord, many times the things that we place value on They're temporary things. For your word tells us that life does not consist in the abundance of things, but in the Spirit of God. And so, Lord, we praise you for the power of things unseen, the power of your Spirit residing in our heart, the power of your Spirit moving in our church, the power of your Spirit reaching out through your word and your people to the lost and the hurting. Lord, we give you praise for the power of the unseen movement of God in our community, in our world. And so, Lord, help us to be vigilant that many th times the things that we see, images, communication, they're not of eternal value. And help us to be discerning of that which is, that we might place our focus on you, on your kingdom, and seek it first. So Lord, today I pray that you'd encourage everyone within sound of your word today. We pray for our sister churches throughout this city, our state, our nation, and the world. We pray for Christians who are in harm's way. We pray for missionaries who go to seek to spread the light and the love of Jesus Christ in spiritually dark places. And Father, as we pray for this, help us to spread the light in the places you lead us to in redeeming and reconciling, loving, forgiving ways. And we pray all this through Christ our Lord. Amen. The power of things unseen. <clears throat> Paul writes, Therefore, we do not lose heart. Now when I read that, it is indelibly printed on my mind a great saint of God who served in this church longer than I've been here who passed away this past year, and we miss him, but we know that he's at peace with God and that his lovely bride joined him this past year as well, and Reverend John and Beverly Saunders. I miss John. I miss his teaching. I miss the camaraderie, the conversations we would have. Some of the best conversations we had were around the Word. And when we would share together, I can remember those times that he would read a passage like that, and in his dry wit he'd say, Therefore now, Jerry... Therefore, what is that therefore? And though I'd often glossed over that conjunction, that's really a good place to, to listen to Paul. What is he speaking of? He's referring to something else in the midst of the problems he's um, living through. <clears throat> therefore, we do not lose heart. Now, if you'll hearken back just a little way in chapter 4, you'll find that Paul lists some of the things that he's dealt with. He says, and it's a beautiful, poetic, uh, enlightening and encouraging passage when he says, we have this treasure, the treasure of salvation, the treasure of God's presence, the treasure of God's Word in jars of clay. 
to show this all-surpassing power is from God and not from us. He, he mentions this several times. And he says, we are pressed on every side. They're under pressure. We're perplexed, but not in despair. Persecuted, but not abandoned. Struck down, but not destroyed. We always carry around in our body the death of Christ Jesus, so that the life of Jesus may also be revealed in our body. Paul is saying, we are having difficulties. We do face challenges. We do have things in our life that we'd rather not go through. But because of God's presence and the all-surpassing promise of of His faithfulness, and of things that await us, His blessings, therefore we do not lose heart. When I read this, I read therefore, I think of John. What is that therefore? It's there to help us to know that when we're going through difficulties, a pandemic, financial loss, problems in relationships, difficulty at the job, disappointment in things we hope for, do not lose heart. Friends, I hope you'll express, uh, have the Holy Spirit express to you today encouragement where you are and how you are and with the things you're dealing with. Do not lose heart. Do not lose heart. Jim Ryan was a, a great <clears throat> runner of the past. In 1964, um, as a junior in high school in Wichita, Kansas, he set the, the world record for high school students. In the se his senior year, he also set another world record for the mile, and he set the U.S. Open world record for the mile as well. To this day, he's the last American runner to ever hold the mile record. But then, in his long and illustrious career, he began to lose races he should have won. He didn't look like himself. And so he had an interview with Howard Cosell, an interview, a sports interviewer, sportscaster of yesteryear. And in that conversation with Howard Cosell, he intimated that he had just lost his fervor. He had lost heart. And so he retired. Later in life, after he retired, he just ceased to run. He lost his passion for running. He lost his will to run. But out of that dismay and that morass in his life, he turned to Christ Jesus and he accepted Christ and became a follower of Jesus. And after that, he began to run and he referred to this in various interviews and writings. For a time, he had just lost heart. You know, these days, I think we're at some risk of folks around us losing heart. I've seen folks who get despondent, dismayed, even depressed because of things that are going on around them, some about the pandemic, some about just life in general. And I'm always careful for us to understand as we counsel with people and as we speak about the reason we have hope is because God is with us. And most of the time it is in those trials and those tribulations that we walk through, not just walk in, but we walk through, that we learn the most and we depend on God the most, and we find in ways that we could not if all things were doing so well in our lives that we can depend on God, that He won't leave us, that He will sustain us. Paul says, we do not lose heart. And when he says that, friend, beloved, I hope you understand this is a man who knows what he's speaking about, who had plenty of reasons to lose heart. In chapter 4, verse 8 and following, he said, We've been pressured, perplexed, hunted, knocked down. In chapter 6, verse 5 and following, he said, He had received stripes from the lash, imprisoned, faced tumult, faced sleeplessness. He faced not having enough to eat. He faced those who left him, abandoned him. And so Paul knew what it was to be, to, to be threatened with that position to lose heart. But he said again to the Corinthians and to us, we, he did not say I do not lose heart. He included all the faithful. We do not lose heart. And he doesn't mince words. He says, though outwardly we are wasting away, yet inwardly we are being renewed day by day. You know, um, 
Maybe it's more a male problem than a female problem. I don't know. I'm just an observer when it comes to that. I'm not a sexist or anything like that, but if it is sexist, then I hope it doesn't come around that way, but I feel like so many times women are so much wiser and many times emotionally stable than men. I know that uh, growing up, uh, there was a time I thought it was bulletproof. Nothing could affect us, but as the years go by, we find we can't run as far. We can't lift as much. We can't do as long as we used to do in our pursuits. Outwardly, we're wasting away. We're not able to do the things we could a couple decades ago. And at times, it may threaten us, may disappoint us. But for the Christian, though physically we can't do what we used to do a decade or two ago, inwardly, if we're growing in Christ, we're being renewed and restored and empowered day by day. Paul knew that. I think Paul's events in his life had taken a toll on him. He'd been shipwrecked, maligned, beaten. The perpetrators thought he was dead, dragged outside, left for dead. He'd been bitten by a viper. He'd been imprisoned, house arrest and dungeon arrest. And yet he can say, we do not lose heart. Yes, I can't do what I used to do, Paul says. Though outwardly we're wasting away, inwardly we're being renewed. Yesterday I watched a little bit of the Green Bay Packers, L.A. Rams game. <laughs> I think I can speak of it clearly. I don't know that we have rivals that love one or the other here, but... I was amazed to see one um, play that the Green Bay quarterback, Aaron Rodgers, m made a run to the end zone, and I thought it was truly remarkable. And some of the commentators said they didn't think it was still in him. It was a remarkable run. And to tell the truth, I didn't know that at his age and with all the issues he's overcome, he was still capable of it. And I was happy for him to see a man, perhaps on the backside of his career, being renewed at that level of competition. And as I was watching that, it didn't matter to me, really. I didn't have a dog in a fight. I didn't care if Green Bay or the Rams won. I was just wanting to see a, a competitive game, and it was that. And as I was watching him, I thought back to my early years in life. and I had a cousin, Alan, who loved the Green Bay Packers, still does. I can still remember him speaking about how he idolized and how he always loved to watch Bart Starr, their quarterback who led them to the first two Super Bowl wins and a few other championships. Bart Starr was a man among men. I think he was a great dad and a, a good man as well as a Hall of Fame quarterback. But a few years ago, the NFL had a... Um, a time where they really recognized some of the greatest Hall of Famers of all time. And at the stadium, that they recognized them, they brought Bart Starr in, and he came in, and I was shocked. Because of life and years and decades of athletic competition, he had to be wheeled in in a wheelchair. He was no longer the giant of a man that won the Ice Bowl against the Dallas Cowboys, for those who remember that game. Here was a man who was just like us, who the ravages of years and disease had left him no longer able to walk, but when they interviewed him and he spoke, you saw the character and the depth of the man. And I think about this as Paul writes. He writes to encourage the church at Corinth. And those people, just as us, will go through trials and tribulations, will go through hard times, being a Christian does not make us impervious to the troubles of life, but it does give us the unseen power to make it through with grace and faith and hope with the knowledge that God will bring us through. We don't lose heart because we know though life may be taking its toll, inwardly the Spirit is renewing us day by day. I thank God for that personally. As God gives me days, I look forward to that in the future. I think about many of our folk who are now homebound or dealing with physical difficulties. I, I hope this is a word to you today that God is saying to you, don't give up. Don't give in. Don't lose heart. 
He knows that you have frailties, that you have limitations now, but you still have a work in His kingdom in worshiping Him and communing with the Spirit and reading His Word and praying for the saints and praying for the work of the kingdom and praying for your church. Yeah, outwardly, we might be wasting away. We're not failing, though. We're being fortified by the Spirit of God in our, in our souls and our hearts. Paul knows what it's like to have wants. And then he writes this, and I think it's remarkable. As I recounted, and, and you know, all those things he's dealt with, things that it could have killed him easily, he writes, for our light and momentary troubles <clears throat> are achieving for us an eternal glory that far outweighs them all. Eternity outweighs by far the difficulties, the heartache, the troubles, the evil that we encounter and overcome by God's Spirit and His will. Scripture seeks us to, to help us put into perspective the troubles that we face as compared to eternity in heaven, in God's presence along with all those who await us, who trusted in Christ Jesus. C.S. Lewis once observed, All that is not eternal is eternally useless. And I think that helps us get perspective as to perhaps where we should direct our attention, our time, our focus. Truly our focus. The story is told about a woman who went into a pharmacy store to return a pair of eyeglasses she had purchased for her husband a week before. And as she brought them to the clerk, the man says, What seems to be the problem, madam? And the lady simply says, I'm returning these glasses I bought for my husband. He's still not seeing things my way. I think a lot of times we get so self-involved, we get so overcome by the challenges that we face that we need to hear Paul communicating the will and the word, the heart of God to us. I know we're going through troubles, but in the scope of eternity, they are but a blip on the radar scope compared to eternity everlasting. The psalmist said in Psalm 90, verse 2, From everlasting to everlasting thou art God. Before the mountains were formed, you were God. You see, it took me a while, but I finally learned through a beloved minister of education and through my studies at Gardner Webb. I'd always thought about eternity being forever in the future, but eternity is forever in the past and in the future. And forever God has been God. He needed no one to create Him. He needed no one to define Him. He is. As Yahweh, He reveals His name to us. I am that I am. I am that I ever have been. I am that I ever will be. And it stretches my mind as I think about eternity forever in the past as well as forever in the future. And Paul says, out of understanding this, this light and momentary troubles are achieving. One translation said, they are working for us an eternal glory that far outweighs the trouble themselves. Back to John Saunders. Therefore, what is it therefore? Paul being a great, I think, lawyer. One who can put together a, a debate or an argument that just holds together so well. He says, so, in contrast to all those things that we are dealing with, we're not losing heart. Though outwardly we're wasting away, inwardly we're being renewed. So, we fix our eyes not on what is seen, but what is unseen. For what is seen is temporary, but what is unseen is eternal. He uses two different words here. <coughs> Excuse me. When Paul says, we fix our eyes, it is a focus. It's a word about focus. It's from the Greek word skopeo, which means to observe, to fix one's eyes upon, to direct one's attention to. And so that's what he's saying to us. Don't focus on the storm. Focus on the one who steals the storm. 
God doesn't just exist for us through the storm. He says, peace be still to the storm. That's His power. And then when Paul says, focus, scopeo, fix your eyes, not on what you can see, but on what you cannot see, the presence, the love, the long-suffering, the faithfulness of God. Four times he uses this word blepo, the root word for, the, for this. And it means to see with the mind's eye, to have the power of understanding, to discern and understand. You see, it's one thing just to see with our physical eyesight. It's another thing to understand and to put into perspective what we see. Paul is saying, friend, yes, you see the ravages of a pandemic. You see the outward consequences of what's going on in our nation politically, financially, those type of things. But there's something below that, something that we can discern. It's not all negative. This is such an opportunity for bringing to people hope, to sharing with others the reason we have hope and we're not overwhelmed. That the light of Christ will not be overcome by darkness in our world, in the hearts of men and evildoers. People need to hear about hope that is not dependent on finances or politics or government or even how we feel, but a hope, as Romans 5 reminds us, that does not disappoint us. What is it that we're told to fix our attention on, to perceive and understand? Not the things we can see, not the physical, not those things we can handle or touch or amass, but the things that will last in eternity. God's Word speaks about those things that on the day of judgment, those things made of straw and wood will burn up, but those things that are of gold and silver, that metaphor, they will last forever. And we'll get to cast those at Jesus' feet. I probably shared this quote several times um, in individual conversations. I don't know that I've used it in a sermon. Perhaps I have. But I love one of the quotes that was made by John D. Rockefeller's executive officer of his companies. He was his right-hand man. And when word came out that John D. Rockefeller, the richest man in America, perhaps in the world, at his death, a reporter from the New York Times came and he said to the executive officer, how much did John D. Rockefeller leave behind? The man didn't bat an eye. He simply said, all of it. All is all. Whether you're a billionaire or a pauper. And what we focus on is not those things that we can amass, but is being renewed in the Spirit, in the Word, in the presence of God. Now, I love studying about history and science. I knew when I was reading this passage from previous uh, university studies, some things just, they stick with me. Some things, you know, I can learn it and perhaps learn it for a test and then it's forever gone. One of my best friends, he has just a remarkable memory. And, and it's not just his memory, it's how he puts into practice those things theologically and financially and in accounting that he's learned. He learns it and it's, it's deep within him. And I was reading this story the other day and when I learned it, I, for some reason I just remembered that, that when things fall to earth, gravity is 32 feet per second squared. It's just one of those things like uh, the, the number pi that stuck with me. And yet I'd never heard this story that in the day of Aristotle, for centuries people believed that he was right. When Aristotle taught that heavier objects fall faster to earth than lighter objects. And when you first think about it, you would think, well, an anvil is going to fall to earth quicker than a sponge will. Just because it's so heavy, that's kind of the logic that some people go with. Now, I remember when I was in aerospace studies that we'd always have that, um, that video and sometimes a, an experiment where you would drop something heavy and something light. And they both fell to earth at the same rate, 32 feet per second squared. It kind of 
reminded you of the wonder of how God's created things. And Aristotle in his day was regarded to be the greatest thinker of all time. People believed surely he couldn't be wrong because he taught this. Heavier objects fall to earth quicker. But in 1589, Galileo summoned professors to the base of the Leaning Tower of Pisa. And sure enough, he did that experiment several times, dropping something heavy and something light. And both came down to earth at the exact same time. He went to the top and pushed off a 10-pound weight and a 1-pound weight. Both landed at the same instant. He did it many times over to the point that he thought he had convinced him. But each professor to a person denied what they saw because of the power of their belief in Aristotle was so strong. For another couple of centuries, people believed after Galileo's experiments and proof that Aristotle was right. I share that because sometimes we're the same way. We have God demonstrate a truth for us. And yet we trust in that which we've experienced. We trust in that which seems logical to us. And yet God is saying, just as I created gravity, just as a 10-pound weight and a 1-pound weight would descend at the same rate. When you go through these times, don't lose heart. Logic, the world, emotion may tell you, give up. There's no hope. But God's Word says, hope never fails. Hope does not leave us disappointed. It, as King James translates it, it maketh not to be ashamed. And so as we go through hard times, hear this from God's Word, from the heart of God. Don't lose heart. Don't give up. For these experiences will pale in comparison to eternity. Hear God's Word saying, He has better things in store for us. May God bless you and keep you. Do not lose heart. Do not give up. Because the weight of eternity in heaven in God's presence far outweighs this temporary challenge. Receive now this benediction based on Psalm 138. Let us pray. Go with confidence into the days ahead, trusting in God's unfailing love and faithfulness. God will not abandon you, for you are the work of his hands, his own creation, and his love endures forever. So go in joy to love and serve the Lord. Amen.